So let's get started. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, probably good evening to uh, participants to the International um, Federation of Medical Students Association and Women in Global Health uh, event uh, to celebrate International Women's Day and um, to look into uh, the issue of women's violence against women as a public health issue. I would like to welcome you all to our event today. And uh, we are here to mark International Women's Day by raising one of the most pressing issues globally in public health, violence against women. My name is Magda Robalo, and I'm the Global Managing Director of Women in Global Health. I've joined uh, Rupa and their team last week, and I'm delighted uh, to be part of this global movement to challenge privileged power. We want this to be an interactive session, and so invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat function and post questions there for our inspiring panelists. This session will be recorded. I want to believe you all agree with that. And it will be shared, it becoming available to be viewed after our event today. This year's International Women's Day team, Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow, remind us of our collective responsibility to ensure the rights of all women and girls, and particularly the right to live with safety and dignity. Statistics put it that approximately one in three women globally has experienced a form of violence against women during a lifetime with significant impacts for their physical and mental health, as well as measurable costs and consequences for societies. Violence against women is a systemic problem witnessed globally in countries with different social, cultural, and economic contexts. Women may be safer from violence in some places than others, but they are not completely safe anywhere in the world. And it is critical to acknowledge that the vast majority of perpetrators are men. Today, our speakers, will address violence against women as it relates to the health sector, because women are 70% of the health workforce and are frequently targeted for violence and harassment in the course of their work by male colleagues, by patients and by members of the community. All genders in the health sector can be subject to violence and harassment in the course of their work. But evidence shows that women tend to be targeted for sexual harassment far more frequently than men. It seems extraordinary that men should consider harming the women whose vocation is saving lives and delivering health services. But this is the everyday reality for women health workers everywhere. Most of this violence and harassment is unreported, unrecorded, and therefore unpunished. Women do not report violence because they fear retaliation, they fear they will not be believed and feel social stigma and shame. We also address the health sector today because women health workers can be a critical part of prevention and response to violence against women. A woman health worker will often be the first point of contact for a woman who has been subject to violence. The way women health workers respond to victims can increase the likelihood that they will report the abuse against them which in turn will increase the possibility of action being taken by the justice system to stop future violence. 
This discussion is timely because the pandemic has marked an increase in violence and harassment of health workers in all regions. It has also marked a significant increase in violence against women in their homes. It is also timely because in June last year, the ILO Convention 190 came into force as the first ever UN Convention on the Elimination of Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. The pandemic has shown a harsh light on the safety and protection of health workers. This is therefore an opportune time to put in place the laws, the policy measures and culture changes necessary to end violence and harassment of women in the health sector at all levels, which in turn would enable them to better protect survivors of violence against women who seek services in the health system. Today, we have brought together panelists from diverse backgrounds, contexts and perspectives to share their experiences of researching and preventing violence against women and supporting survivors. We look forward to the guidance since we are confident that feasible policy solutions exist. Our first speaker, Dr. Avni Amin from the World Health Organization's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research on Violence Against Women, will give the keynote speech. After Dr. Amin, Dr. Rupa Dart, Executive Director for Women in Global Health, will introduce and moderate our expert panel. Thank you once again for joining us today, and I have now the pleasure of giving the floor to Dr. Amin. Dr. Amin, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to start my video, but it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So I will ask our uh, Becca or uh, uh, Claudia to please um, <clears throat> help me start the video. But in the meantime, just to say, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you so much uh, to IFIMSA and Women in Glo Global Health for this invitation to mark the International Women's Day. I'm going to speak to three things. One is uh, really putting on the table why the health sector has a very, very critical role to play in responding to violence against women. Second is uh, recognizing that women health workers have led the way in responding to violence against women in the health sector. This has really been a field that has been built, especially on the backs of the work that has been done by nurses. And the third is really uh, putting on the table what we know so far about violence faced by women health workers, be it doctors, nurses, midwives, or any other cadre of health workers. So Becca, if I can please ask you to start the screen. Thank you so much. If you can move to the next slide, please. Great. Um, as Magda said, uh, the one in three figure has been uh, based on WHO estimates and it really reflects experience of physical and or sexual violence, mostly at the hands of an intimate partner. If you account or add other forms of violence, including emotional violence, including economic violence, non-partner sexual violence, trafficking, forced marriage, uh, acid attacks, honor killings, etc. This one in three figure is likely to be much, much higher. Now, sadly, what we also know now, based on the WHO estimates published last year, is violence against women starts early in the lives of adolescent girls and young women one in four young women will have been subjected to violence by an intimate partner by the time they reach their mid-20s. And this has devastating consequences uh, for them, not just in the immediate term, but for their life in many, many ways. Next slide, please. We know that violence against women, as Magda pointed out, affects the health of women and, ch and their children. But just to give you some data to put it in perspective, 42% of women who experience violence report injuries. Women who experience intimate partner violence are twice as likely to experience depression. 
women who experience intimate partner violence are 1.5 times more likely to have a sexually transmitted infection or HIV in some settings. And women who experience intimate partner violence are reported to be 4.5 times more likely to attempt a suicide. For unwanted pregnancies, we know that women who experience partner violence are twice as likely to have unwanted pregnancies and twice as likely to need abortion. And similarly, women who experience partner violence are twice as likely to have substance use uh, uh, problems such as alcohol or tobacco use. So if, if these figures are, uh, are anything to, to indicate, we know that the health consequences of violence are quite devastating for women. We also know that violence affects their children. We know that women, children who grow up uh, being exposed to violence in the homes between parents are more likely to have anxiety disorders, less likely to perform well at school and grow up either being subjected to violence themselves or become perpetrators perpetrators of violence because violence is a learned behavior. And there is some very interesting data that shows how the brain of a child that's exposed to violence actually looks very different than the brain of the child that has not been exposed to violence. Next slide, please. So we know that health providers therefore have a critical role in supporting women in minimizing the impact of violence in terms of their health and social consequences and in contributing to preventing violence from happening in the first place. So why health providers? Women and girls experiencing violence are more likely to use health services. They may not come to health services saying I've been subjected to violence, but they will come with, with a whole host of symptoms and health conditions because they experience them more frequently than women who are not abused. For many women, health providers are often the first point of professional contact. We assume that women should go to, to the police and the legal and justice system, but many women do not want, especially if the perpetrator is a spouse or somebody they are fi financially dependent on, they may not actually want to go to the police, but may want uh, health services and psychological support, which they, they think they might get from a health provider provided that they are treated well in the health systems. And we know that all women are likely to seek health services at some point in their life, be it for child health, be it for family planning, be it for maternal health. Next slide, please. So what should then be the role of providers? And we really believe that there is a circumscribed set of role that health providers should play, but also things that the health provider should not cross the limits or boundaries of, their, of what they're expected to do. So the first and foremost role for health providers is to ensure the safety and do no harm. To identify violence, because women may not speak about it, but providers can ask about violence in an empathetic way. If women disclose violence, then the first and foremost thing is to provide an empathetic response, to make sure that all the clinical care that the survivor needs, be it injury response, be it psychological support, be it mental health support is offered. Make sure that if the woman is articulating a need or wants to go to the police or any other uh, legal and uh, psychosocial support such as shelter, livelihood, et cetera, that those referrals are provided to document violence, to make sure that if the woman wants to go to the police or file a case that the uh, medical legal evidence is documented. And health providers, of course, can play an absolutely critical role as advocates and as role models in speaking out against the unacceptability of violence. Providers, however, are not responsible for solving all the violence-related issues that the woman may be facing or addressing all the violence-related needs she may have. It's just not possible and it's really not uh, there within their mandate. And we don't always ask providers to address all aspects of treatment, care, and support in one consultation. One of the most uh, frequent barriers that providers describe in responding to violence is that they are swamped, they don't have time, 
Uh, we have been doing these uh, trainings of healthcare workers in settings where there are 200 patients waiting out of, uh, in, the, in the outpatient department. So one has to be realistic and practical in terms of really saying what the providers can and cannot do. Next slide. The health sector, recognizing the important role of what health providers can and should be doing to respond to violence, the health sector has been given a political mandate through the World Health Assembly resolution. In 2016, the World Health Assembly endorsed a, a global plan of action on strengthening the health system's response to violence against women and girls. And the, there are four action pillars of this global plan of action. The first is strengthening the leadership and governance of the health system to uh, address violence, which means putting in place policies, protocols, guidelines, training materials, and really getting health workers and health uh, policymakers to champion this issue. The second is, of course, around health service delivery to make sure that comprehensive health services are provided, but also to make sure that there is training of healthcare providers, both at the pre-service or undergraduate level, as well as the graduate and postgraduate level and in-service training. The third pillar is around fostering prevention, which means really thinking of how the health sector itself can implement prevention programs, but also work with other sectors like the police, like the education sector in putting in place prevention programs and policies that are evidence-based. And finally, to really have, uh, have the health sector through the surveillance as well as the health management information systems, document violence, collect data and monitor program for quality services. Next step, please. So here are some of the guidelines and tools that WHO has produced over the last many years on responding to violence against women through the health sector. Uh, previous slide, please, yeah. We have two guidelines. One is responding to uh, clinical and uh, uh, responding to intimate partner violence and uh, sexual violence. Uh, WHO clinical and policy guidelines. And we also have guidelines for responding to children and adolescents who've experienced sexual abuse. Then from these guidelines, we've produced practical manuals. One is called Healthcare for Women Subjected to Violence, which is a clinical handbook providing detailed how-to guidance for healthcare providers. And another is called Strengthening Health Systems for Responding to uh, Violence Against Women, which is a manual for health managers and administrators to make sure that there are uh, programs and services and monitoring and evaluation systems in place to have good health systems response. And based on this, we now have a curriculum for the health sector to respond to violence against women, which is both for health workers as well as health managers. And all of this is now being put together in a resource kit or a resource package, which is available on WHO websites. We're also coming up with an e-learning, which will allow healthcare providers to go through our training materials and content through a self, uh, on a self-paced uh, basis. And with uh, PEPFAR and CDC, we have produced a quality assurance toolkit that allows services to monitor the quality of what they are uh, providing to survivors and make improvements in quality of care. Next slide, please. So just quickly to walk you through some of the recommendations that WHO has produced and that are all contained and reinforced through all the tools that I've mentioned in the previous slide. The most important pillar of our guidelines and recommendation is what we call woman-centered care. And the big intervention under woman-centered care is really what we call first-line support. And first line support is really uh, centered around making sure that when a woman discloses violence, that providers are trained to listen empathetically, to convey a non-judgmental response, to ensure privacy and confidentiality, to ensure their safety, and to link women to other services based on what they need and what they have articulated as their priority. The second area of intervention is how to identify survivors of partner violence. And here, what we've said is healthcare providers should ask about violence, about intimate partner violence, based on a set of clinical conditions that are likely to have been caused or complicated by intimate partner violence. So it's, it's what we call clinical inquiry, but not screening. WHO does not recommend screening for intimate partner violence. 
The third area is around clinical care for survivors of sexual violence or assault. And here there is a package of comprehensive post-rape care that includes first-line support, emergency contraception, STIs, HIV prophylaxis, and a complete history and recording of events to make sure that uh, uh, if the woman wants to get medical legal uh, 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 care in terms of uh, going to the courts, that, that the detailed medical legal evidence is documented. In terms of the policies, we have uh, recommended that not only be uh, uh, not only should training be provided to, to healthcare providers at it, uh, in in service, but also pre service, and it should be for doctors, nurses, and midwives. And training should not just include clinical care, first line support, and uh, mental health support but also address the biases that healthcare providers themselves have towards, uh, towards survivors and that often lead to stigmatization of survivors. And in terms of the policy recommendation, it is really about integrating care for response to violence at the primary healthcare level rather than standalone services so that access is made available to survivors at the community level. And WHO does not recommend mandatory reporting by healthcare providers to the police of adult women who disclose violence. And this is a very controversial area. But one of the reasons we took this stance is really being guided by the principles of respecting the survivor's autonomy and recognizing that women are adults who can make their own choices and decisions. And the role of the healthcare providers in this case is to offer women that they could be helped to make the report if they want to, but not to do it without women's consent or uh, do it to the law regardless of what the woman says. Next slide, please. So in terms of some of the training uh, operational uh, requirements for training of healthcare providers, which is contained in the health manager's manual, we do advise health managers to make sure that every Clinic has assigned necessary healthcare providers to care for women subjected to violence so that people know that this is in their terms of reference, that they are given training, and that they are given ongoing mentoring and supervision so that their performance is continuously improved and uh, supported. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of the training curriculum that we have. And the, based on this, we'll also be producing the e-learning, but really the, the curriculum is competency-based. And the idea is not only to build general knowledge of healthcare providers of violence as a public health problem, but also to make sure that they know what are the behaviors and values that contribute to a safe and supportive and woman-centered culture in healthcare provision, build the clinical skills, and also knowledge of how to access resources, not just for their patients, but also for themselves. Next slide. So it's just a snapshot of one of the job aids that we use in, in training healthcare providers to offer first line support. And we've developed a job aid that is called with a mnemonic lives, which is really listen closely with empathy, inquire about the woman's needs and concerns first, validate her experience and show that you believe in her uh, story, enhance the safety, so safety assessments and planning, and then support the survivor to connect with additional services as she needs. And a lot of training goes in our work to really make sure that uh, survivors are uh, building these communication, essential communication skills to offer first line support. This is a training that we've done in Namibia with, the, with master trainers. Next slide, please. In session 12, which is around mental health support, we also have exercises that we actually recognize that health providers who are doing this work themselves may be experiencing violence in their own lives or that uh, caring for survivors and listening to stories of abuse can actually lead to vicarious trauma. So we do talk about self-care for healthcare providers who are experiencing vicarious trauma, tips for maintaining providers' own emotional health and managing their own re reactions and trauma triggers when they're talking to women about violence, 
and also being aware of their own emotions and getting help and support for themselves. There is a set of stress reduction exercises that we make healthcare providers go through, not only for themselves in managing their own stress, but also teaching women uh, as part of uh, basic mental health support in, in very low resource settings that they can practice with their patients. Next slide. And here, I just wanted to switch the gears a little bit, and it's really the last two, two sort of set of slides that I wanted to highlight. The first is really recognizing that this field of health response to violence against women was built by nurses. In high-income countries, sexual assault response was pro is provided often by what, what is called SANES, or Specialized Trained Sexual Assault Forensic Nurse examiner, Examiners. And in low and middle income countries, the role of nurses in forensic and medical legal examinations varies depending on national le legislation. In some settings, nurses are allowed to do that. And in other settings, it's only doctors that are allowed to play that role uh, as per the law. But nurses are often the ones who spend the most uh, extensive time with, pa with patients. So they do end up playing a lot of uh, critical support role in offering first line support in many of these uh, countries. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, just to, to talk about the point that Magda also brought up, that we know that healthcare providers themselves face violence, but to acknowledge that we don't have very good global data, we have studies that have documented high levels of violence in different settings. In the US, for example, a survey of over a thousand academic medical staff showed 30% reporting sexual violence. In Rwanda, a smaller sample of close to 300 health workers showed that nearly 40% had experienced some form of violence. And in Nepal, this data was around 42% of 190 female health workers. We also know that this violence that women health workers face in the workplace, but also in their own personal lives, has a huge effect on their own health, the health of their family and their ability to provide patients with quality care limits the productivity and leads to burnout. For example, in South Africa, one of the studies that was conducted with nurses who were offering or who were trained to offer support to intimate partner violence clients found that nurses themselves were experiencing violence. Nurses thought that this violence was normal and nurses therefore did not often recognize uh, violence that women were disclosing or did not probe them because they thought this is just part of what women are supposed to go through. And therefore, they couldn't actually um, care for survivors of violence in the most effective way. Next slide. So what do we do about addressing violence that women health workers face? In the health manager's manual that WHO has put out for responding to violence, we have called for implementation of policies that model and promote gender equality. This includes having uh, clear guidance and clear mechanisms for preventing clients and patients from being subjected to disrespect and abuse in healthcare settings, as well as policies that uh, prevent sexual harassment in the workplace and implementing them to make sure that there is redressal and services for those who are subjected to violence, be it staff or be it clients, to make sure that health managers are creating awareness of what behaviors are inappropriate and broadly to implement policies that are promoting equal opportunities for male and female candidates in hiring, promotion, and paying them equally for comparable work. So this is in a way saying that, you know, before we talk about how to respond to violence in the lives of women, we need to be able to role model practice and demonstrate gender equality in the health workplace as, as a setting an example for, for being able to do this work for, for, for patients. Next slide, please. And I think this should be the last one. So I just wanted to end with this, which is that, you know, health workers often tell us that, oh God, this is such a huge problem. How can we make a difference? We can't change everything in the society. And when we do trainings with health workers, we always say that it's the small changes that make a big difference. And this is a quote from a Salvadorian woman who said that the doctor helped me feel better by saying, I don't deserve this treatment. And he helped me to make a plan to leave the house the next time my husband came home drunk. So I think health providers can do these small little changes 
in the way they communicate with their patients. And yet what we find from women telling us over and over again, that this is the first time that somebody has believed their story and that has a big impact on their journey to healing and recovering from the abuse that they're experiencing. Thank you very much. I hand over back to Magda. Thank you very much, Dr. Amin, for those uh, statistics, for those proposals on what can be done uh, within the health sector by all of us, even if we are not um, in the health sector, but each one of us has uh, options for uh, joining hands to fight violence against women. Thank you. That was very, very insightful. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Rupa Dad, the Executive Director and Founder of Women in Global Health. Rupa is a passionate advocate for gender equality in global health and the leading voice in the movement to correct the gender imbalance in global health leadership. In 2019, uh, Rupa was recognized in the Gender Equality Top 100 as one of the most influential people in global policy. It is really a pleasure uh, to have Rupa uh, moderate the panel that uh, follows. Uh, Rupa, you have the floor. Thank you, Magda, and thank you for the warm welcome. Um, it is really uh, so great to be with all of you. Um, and uh, just, um, Avni, you know, Every time you talk about this topic, I'm always learning something new. Um, and as a health provider myself, you know, some of the key messages that you, you drove home there, especially around the fact that healthcare workers are drivers of this agenda to hear that nurses have been critical to making sure that violence against women um, and that gender-based violence issues are being addressed um, and that there's resources being designed so that they are at the primary healthcare center. I think that is uh, so enlightening and it shows the power of health workers. And as we are uh, convening this uh, conversation together with our partners, the International Federation of Medical Student Associations, um, and seeing that the next generation is learning about these tools, eager to be part of the solution. And as you said, it, it takes just sometimes small changes to make the big difference. Um, so uh, thank you, Avni, for, for joining us. And we're going to be hearing more from you in the panel. Uh, but I'd like to kick off by introducing our other panelists um, who are also going to be bringing uh, insightful perspectives uh, from uh, a wide range of experiences and organizations. Um, uh, we're joined today by Miss Claudia Sismus, who is the liaison officer for sexual and reproductive health and rights issue, um, including HIV and AIDS in IFMSA. She's a medical student from Poland, um, and um, she is also uh, really has experience working on uh, broader issues of uh, meaningful youth engagement, the sustainable development goals. Um, so Claudia will be hearing from you in a moment. Um, we're joined by Dr. Kalkadan Belanea. She's a policy associate at Women in Global Health. Uh, she is a medical doctor and public health professional based in Ethiopia. Um, she serves as a policy associate for us at Women in Global Health and is supporting um, the work that is on prevention of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Um, and I have to say, even before joining our team, uh, um, Dr. Kalkadan has uh, been working on this issue particularly. Um, we also have the privilege of having Ms. Maya Harper join us. She is the Director of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights from in, in, in Gender Health. Um, uh, Malaya is responsible for integrating a comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights approach into everything that eGender Health programming does. Um, she brings over 20 years of working experience in international uh, sexual reproductive health and rights and gender equality. Um, we'll be hearing from her soon. And we're also joined by Mr. Uh, Crispin uh, Afiu, who's um, role is uh, at uh, Gender and Wet Technical Specialist at ICRW Africa Hub. Uh, Mr. Crispin is a gender and uh, a, a we technical specialist based out of ICRW, where he conceptualized, implements, and provides technical oversight to multiple research and evaluation uh, projects on gender, women's economic empowerments, um, and he has uh, experience on programs, particularly on pathways to eliminating sexual and gender-based um, violence, um, and it really going to also bring us um, cultural, um, you know, uh, country cultural 
context specific insights as he's looked at multicultural environments in Kenya and East Africa. So we have a very exciting panel and we'll be inviting um, Avni to also join us in this conversation so we can truly have a dynamic uh, discussion. I invite all of you to please use um, uh, the Q&A function. We will be taking a lot of questions from the audience today. Um, and also if you have uh, you know, other, other aspects you'd like to just have a dynamic discussion, we have kept our chat function available. Uh, engage us on social media. Um, those details will be also shared in the chat function. So I want to uh, first turn to you, Cla to Claudia, you know, after, um, you know, this, this um, setting the scene uh, uh, keynote from um, Avni, um, you know, what can you tell us about the role of health professionals, um, including doctors and um, future trainees and future health professionals in responding to um, violence against women? Uh, thank you, Rupa. So I actually, a lot of my answers were, were actually reflected by Avni before, but I guess I can give a bit of perspective from medical students and like um, professionals in training. Um, so yeah, representing 1.3 million medical students in this panel, I would like to reflect that, um, well, first of all, um, med medical professionals are a profession of public uh, trust. So as Avni mentioned, it, it might be the first point of reference they actually seek uh, as uh, when they seek help. But we also have a crucial role for real, making them realize that the issue exists in their in their families or in their lives overall. We can also play a role to recognize the symptoms and then create a follow up plan and so on. And that's that does not always include um, like recognizing bruises and so on, also mental health um, problems that are a result of, of experiencing violence, um, but also as a follow-up of chronic diseases that result from um, experiencing violence for a long time. Um, and as, and this is extremely important since Avni also mentioned that they attend medical, um, medical professionals more often, uh, so once again, we are playing a crucial role in there to recognize and also to, to make them realize and also to ensure that we can help them. And um, something that we try to implement and um, emphasize in, in our work as IFMSA is that it is important to ask during regular checkups whether a patient experiences violence. And this came a little bit tricky uh, and hard when you start to implement those questions in, in like regular visits. Um, but what we try to implement is that ensuring the patients, this is something that we ask regularly. So we can, we can start with saying that I ask this to every patient and then following up on the experiences of violence and like asking if, the, if that's the case and so on. So this is something we tried to implement. And there was there was um, a study in South Africa that showed that 80% of women that, um, that seek help or attend medical professionals in general, they would like to be asked about it. So this is also something that um, that's very important in, in preventing violence and also mitigating the, um, the consequences. Um, and as also Avni mentioned, we try to emphasize that that we need to have a legal follow up um, only after after consent of the patient, and also ensuring confidentiality, safety, creating um, the, the follow up plan, and so on, uh, finding asylum, ensuring support. Something that we also tr notice as medical students is that um, medical school lack social accountability in terms of uh, violence against women. So we also try to advocate for gen, uh, for violence against women, sensitive medical education. And that's once again, non, not only include recognizing symptoms, but also a wide range of soft skills. Um, so even though we have, um, we have communication skills in medical school, um, medical curriculum, this does not tailor the needs of how to treat and how to care for survivors of, of violence. Um, so we also try to showcase the efforts of IFMSA. We, we um, applied with the workshop for um, medical education professionals um, for, for Amy conference. So we would try to raise awareness, awareness about that, how important it is for us, because um, as medical students, we are not confident enough um, to, to care about survey survivors we just don't know how and this is this is why it's important uh, for for us to 
to reach out to universities, to reach out to the teachers, uh, academics, and so on. So we just just try to do that. Um, aside from our tremendous work on on workshops, uh, we we have a lot of sessions and workshops for our members from 100. Uh, 30 countries in um, in which we try to emphasize how important it is for us, what's the role of medical professionals in recognizing and helping survivors, um, and so on. So what we try to um, implement in, in all of those advocacy work is that, uh, first of all, we want to we want to make um, professionals being sensitive to the issue, also to be mindful of how they speak, if they use non-victimizing language, if they care for consent, if, they, if the, the interview is also um, sensitive or does not cross boundaries and so on. Um, so um, despite having the um, um, great guidelines from WHO, still medical schools uh, do not implement in that scale um, education of sufficient level for us to to go to hospital after we graduate and uh, support survivors in, in the way we would like to. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention is um, also something that was mentioned before, is that even, even though we are first point of reference, we can also be uh, subjected to violence and, or not even us, but our colleagues. And um, violence inside and in the, in workplace is something that also exists in public, um, uh, in healthcare sector. So I just wanted to emphasize that we in IFMSA create advocates, and this is something that's extremely important for uh, preventing vi um, violence against women, um, because that does not always include advocating for policies in the workplace or legal changes in the country, but also not being a bystander. So just standing against violence that's happening in your workplace. So we also try to build con uh, confidence of med medical students to never be afraid and speak against violence in their environment, outside of medical appointment and so on. So um, that will be um, everything for me. Thank you. Claudia, thank you for your insights and, you know, a lot of takeaways there, uh, you know, one is really making sure that uh, the issue of violence against women um, is uh, seen as a universal occurrence that needs to be addressed and prioritized as a public health issue, but also part of medical curriculum, um, you know, sensitizing medical education um, in a way where this is integrated. And I, and I could say that, you know, uh, as someone that's gone to training, not enough is being done. Um, and, you know, it's really great to see that uh, IFMSA as a federation has prioritized this and, and building on this, you know, a, and really the unique perspective you're bringing um, as a entity that represents millions of medical students worldwide, um, the violence that medical students themselves are facing, what type of solutions um, are you hearing from, from members, um, you know, especially some of your national members um, on what you want to see? Uh, and I see that, you know, the call to action that you made to WHO already, let's get this into medical curriculum more effectively, let's leverage the influence of WHO. I see, Avni, you've already uh, made an invitation to IFMSA, so we'll pick up on that in a moment. Uh, but turning to you, Claudia, you know, the, the violence that um, trainees often face is, um, in very high numbers, 30 to five, 30 to fifty percent, when surveys have been done, um, uh, and you know, have you guys been able to do a survey and I from the state to figure out what those numbers look like, um, and uh, also building on that, what type of you know sort of solutions are being put forward as you are sensitizing your community to this um, issue. Uh, thank you, Rupa, for your question. So currently we are um, designing the survey on gender-based violence that we want to also include um, um, discrimination in medical education and also discrimination in training in general. So we would like to launch it somewhere around the end of March. Um, so maybe we will have some um, interesting data around that um, soon in a couple of months. Uh, but so far, we do not have that many information on, on this issue. But um, yeah, we're just accelerating the action towards that. And I would like to uh, thank Avni for the invitation. And we would love to participate in creating better medical education um, for us. But yeah, I do agree that um, 
discrimination in medical education and also for young professionals is something that include um, that exists because it it's just like intersection of two identities that are vulnerable. It's First of all, being young and inexperienced, so that that creates a power dynamics. And then when once you're a woman, that uh, that it also uh, creates um, another vulnerability, which is living in the society that's not gender equal, um, and therefore your experiences of discrimination are much more amplified. Um, and, and this is something that we try to do when we look into the problem in IFMSA. We try to look um, look through it in an intersectional way. So we also try to include other um, left behind populations such as people with disabilities, LGBT um, community and so on. So we are looking forward to also analyze our data through this. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, you know that was actually one of the questions that was coming from the audience is uh, how do you think about and not just um, you know from one lens um, as women, but you know who are the women that are getting most affected and um, and within that community the broader broader agenda. So we'll be coming back to you. Um, and uh, it is uh, really great to kind of you know continue down the career progression and ask uh, next uh, Kalkadon, who is um, a physician uh, gone through training uh, and and Kalkadon, you know turn it to you, women health professionals are um, also victims of violence and harassment. We've heard from the, the trainee perspective. Can you elaborate on that from your experience in Ethiopia and, um, and you know, some of the solutions and why getting power into the hands of women, having women in leadership roles, having gender parity. We've heard that being one of the recommendations within um, Avni slides, uh, slides, a presentation keynote. So turning it to you to um, share it from your perspective and, um, and what are some of the things that you have been involved in? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupa. Uh, similar to other workplace setups, healthcare facilities are not free from violence against women. As Dr. Magda mentioned during her opening speech, women health professionals are exposed to violence from their colleagues, clients, attendants, and also from other community members. And the finding from our project in Ethiopia that I was a part was a testimony of that. So as a group of voluntary doctors, uh, freshly graduated, a couple of years back, we came together to mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence and advocate for safe space for healthcare. So the objective was to highlight stories of sexual harassment in the workplace and promote discussion among health professionals, uh, but also to call up for leaders to act on this, uh, on this issue. So we were able to do that uh, uh, by collaborating with another uh, organization which has a health which is a health professional social media platform on Facebook. So we collaborated with them and we called upon healthcare workers to share their stories anonymously and share their experience working in Ethiopian health facilities. Uh, initially we only received a couple of stories and we started sharing the stories with that platform anyway. But so once the experience of one person was shared, more and more stories came and it became a huge campaign more than what we anticipated initially. So something that we have learned is that there is a lack of awareness among health professionals and among hospital administrators, what constitutes as a violence against women, what is a workplace harassment. So there is no line to actually say what is wrong and what is right. And most of the perpetrators were male colleagues and mostly they are the women's, the women health professional seniors. And most of their stories show that uh, they have reported their case to their supervisor, but nothing was done. And those who did not report say that they believe that no one would believe them and they don't wanna go through the trouble. So they didn't report it. So they also believe that the setup and the hospital infrastructure exposed them. For example, sharing duty rooms, sharing changing rooms with male colleagues. And also there are some duty rooms without locks and there was dark corridors and dark rooms without electric facility in some points that exposed them and exacerbated the issue. And there is also the cultural and hierarchical system of medical school that exacerbate the power imbalance. Additional to the gender inequality, this hierarchical system increased the power imbalance and plays a huge role in violence against women. And the condition was worse for female health professionals who were deployed to, with, uh, to another place from their hometown. So there has been reports of physical, psychological fear, like also guilty, withdrawal, denial, and self-blame was also reported. Women 
also talked about, they have decreased motivation of working, they have loss of focus, and their careers were interrupted because they were forced to leave the hospital and change uh, to another hospital. And once the stories were shared, there was a reaction from the community through the social media. So most of them were positive and encouraging uh, of the survivors, but there was some, not an insignificant number, that they were victim blaming and also shaming with statements such as that they are exaggerating and fabricating the stories as well as uh, workplace harassment is not a priority in a country where there is huge issues like female genital mutilation, child marriage. So it is not a priority issue. Those were informed. So this shows that there is a gap of knowledge. There is a gap of uh, understanding because those these women, health professionals, are the, one of the few who broke the barriers and reached this status. But even if they reach their status, the maximum in their country, but they're still facing harassment. And that tell us that told us there is a huge uh, assignment that we have to do. And it also led that uh, this movement led that everybody was aware that the, the, the existence and the depths of workplace harassment within the healthcare settings in Ethiopia, it was never discussed before and it was very much highlighted. Following the stories, sector-wide workplace harassment study was launched and a couple of, like, couple of survivors were communicated with the healthcare administrator and the report was actually pushed forward. And some also requested a transfer but were able to get that. And hospital administrator actually took action. Uh, some solved the infrastructure problem by separating the changing rooms and some also institutionalized new policies. And one of the biggest hospitals in Ethiopia also included workplace harassment as a training for induction training for new residents in new medical school. That we this was this was only done within a few weeks, and it led to this bad, a huge uh, policy change. And there is a, this is also a testimony that there is a huge underreporting, and that the extent is unknown. So and leaders are not aware of the extent to even take action. So much is needed, much is needed. And we need to encourage women to report and act on the report, but also establish a safe reporting mechanism. Regarding the question of role of women leadership, as mentioned above, the power imbalance is one of the root causes of sexual abuse and uh, exploitation and harassment. And the existence of this imbalance is re reflected with having small number of women leaders uh, in healthcare setup, while they constitute or around 70% of the healthcare workforce. Uh, there is also an occupational segregation of women in lower status roles and specialties, exacerbating this power gap. Addressing this power imbalance can reduce the, work, uh, the workplace uh, violence against women. And vice versa, reducing workplace uh, violence will also help address the leadership and pay gap in occupational segregation by empowering women and also creating safe uh, space. So to have women in decision-making table uh, when it comes to violence against women is very, very much critical. And it starts from by diluting the power imbalance into addressing dismissive behavior during reporting. So therefore, gender parity in leadership is one of the initiatives we advocate as an organization uh, to end sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Thank you. Kalkadan, uh, just very insightful. And I think what really stood out in your uh, sharing of uh, examples was just the pragmatic aspects of it. You know, imagining um, that locker rooms are shared their dark rooms. Um, I mean, these are things that are not, uh, you know, universal in every every uh, context. But to hear that, you know, that you have been able to identify some of those, um, you know, real uh, vulnerabilities in health systems in Ethiopia and, and spotlighting it. What also stood out, and and you know, this is something that is um, getting more and more attention is the perception of when women um, share their testimonies um, or do report um, the violence that they're facing, the sexual harassment, the bullying, um, sexual exploitation, that it is often seen as an exaggeration um, and that there must be cultural issues or generational issues. Um, and you touch upon that and, it, and it's a universal aspect. It doesn't matter if you're in a country like Ethiopia. I had recently seen a post um, from Australia where saying one out of five women 
three out of 10 men think that every time um, if sexual harassment is being reported, it's an exaggeration. So we know we have a lot to do on the mindset, uh, but it really begins by getting these stories out, these testimonies uh, to be exact. Um, and you also highlighted uh, the, the power imbalance aspect of it and that it, the root driver is um, power uh, from your perspective when it really comes um, to why this issue is so pervasive. And so on that note, I'm really uh, looking forward um, to hearing from you, uh, Malaya. These are issues you are um, uh, not only working on in your formal role at, um, in gender health, but it is an area that you have uh, really dedicated um, yeah, in, in your own personal leadership and the issues that you prioritize um, working on. So, you know, I'd like to um, kind of, you know, step back a little bit and, and, um, and ask you, you know, what are you seeing as the main barriers to addressing uh, violence um, against women globally, and uh, and especially when it comes to the global health sector, which you've been a part part of for decades, you've been part of many types of different organizations in the space. Um, and how do we also make sure we reframe um, this issue as uh, in the workplace as um, from being acceptable to not and as not serious to really being totally unacceptable because it is very much about shifting the mindset. Um, so turning to uh, turning it to you, Malai, the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I really want to thank the previous speakers, uh, Avni, Kalkadan, and, and Claudia as well. You know, some things are worth repeating, and so some things will be repeated. And Kalkadan, I loved how you made it really come alive, the experience so that people can see the tangibility of things. You know, when, when we talk about the main barriers to addressing violence against women globally, and specifically in the global health sector, there's some easy but very important answers that come to mind. One we hear again and again around the main barriers are there's really four kind of areas. We hear about resources and financial resources. We hear about the lack of data across the spectrum of uh, types of violence. We hear about fragmented responses. And we've been hearing more and more recently in the last few years about a lack of a systemic view of violence against women. And by this, I mean, what, uh, we know that um, within the health sector or among NGOs and civil society, there's multiple programs that work to prevent uh, violence against women and support survivors. But very few times has the lens been turned inward to really accept that these same organizations, institutions, and the health sector themselves perpetrate violence and harassment among female health workers and staff. And uh, Kalkadan, you really reflected that in your remarks. Um, we've seen this in the health sector. We've seen this in INGOs. Many know the the Oxfam case, and we've seen this in the United Nations, both in terms of staff cases of sexual harassment and recent horrific reports of sexual exploitation and uh, abuse against communities uh, that they should be serving and protecting. So these four areas uh, are not incorrect. You know, there is a lack of resources, a lack of data, a fragmentation in response, lack of systemic view. But if we only couch it like that, it's rather convenient because the issue always gets knocked off the table because of competing priorities, right? There, well, there's this, there's so many things that we have to uh, deal with. It's really important that we don't ignore the elephant in the room and all the previous speakers have mentioned this, uh, that when you look across the whole spectrum, whether it's female genital mutilation, early child and forced marriage, violence against women in the workplace, organizational systems that perpetuate it, the main barrier really is the unwillingness to accept that unequal power and gender inequality, including the intersectionality in our organizations, in our institutions, is the root cause of violence. This is what's driving violence. Um, now, it's likely accepted among the panelists here, but outside of this room and this echo chamber, it's really not widely accepted. And this is really shocking because despite violence against women and harassment being a massive crisis of pandemic proportions, both in communities and in the workplace, 
We often speak about violence against women as specific events or individual events that need to be tackled one by one rather than having something that really emanates from the structure of our organizations and our institutions and our society. And I think we know that if we did accept that violence against women is rooted in gender inequality and power, it would really require accepting substantial changes in how power is localized and gender transformative changes in communities and in our institutions. And before I conclude, I want to address what I see is a little bit of a myth in global health and local health organizations. And that is that somehow in Europe, I'm based in Switzerland or in North America, essentially that this myth that Western institutions are dealing with workplace uh, violence against women uh, differently or better. And I think that that's both um, dangerous and inherently racist. In fact, in my experience, um, I would go as far as to say that institutions that have really high capacity and an army of lawyers are actually better prepared to fight to preserve their organizational reputation and are sometimes more resistant uh, to accepting what's happening. There are, of course, some uh, glimmers of change and hope that I continue to hang on to, but I wanted to put that out there. So if we accept that this is rooted, that it's a public health crisis rooted in unequal power and gender inequality, uh, then I would say that we need to look at how our systems and organizational structures change. And the previous speakers have really put forward some really important um, uh, examples and lessons here. I want to ask two things that we really need to put on the table and limit it to that. And one is uh, something that um, Anne Keeling presented me with quite recently is some thinking by Dr. Mazzucato on what do we value? You know, the pandemic has made it clear that much of the economy relies on unpaid labor, mostly shouldered by women and women health workers are at the forefront of the pandemic response. So how do we value this? I think that needs to change within our institutions and uh, new models of leadership. And the UN Women Executive Director, Simon Bajo said two days ago when she was addressing the security council that it was clear to her now more than ever that actually the models of leadership that we have now aren't working and we need new forms of gender transformative and feminist leadership and I do realize that this is progressive realization and we need to take steps to get there but we need to actually create those opportunities for that to happen thank you Thank you, Malaya, for just uh, your reflections and also just challenging us to the really uh, think about, you know, our, oh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for uh, your reflections and challenging us to uh, uh, rethink what uh, assumptions we really have, and especially this about issue about the universality aspect of it, assuming that if you have um, a, an institution in a high highly resourced country or a highly resourced institution itself that they are possibly dealing with um, these issues in a, uh, in a better way. And, you know, one of the numbers that also I should say a shout out to Anne Keeling, as she shared with me, if institutions are reporting that they have zero cases of sexual harassment, um, violence, or a form of bullying, then they clearly are doing a terrible job because we know when you look at these numbers of 30 to 50% that every institution is facing some form um, of, of, of violence against women and yet they're not capturing it and they're purposely not capturing it. And so this is where we must um, really tackle the issue head on. Um, and so, uh, and it's, it is not only just a dangerous uh, uh, as, as you highlighted, but it's also racist to assume these are issues only happening in low 
resource settings. Um, so we need to continue to uh, challenge um, the narrative around that. Um, and also the point that you uh, highlighted is, you know, if we go again to the root issues, uh, if this is about um, addressing going from the one on one individual experiences, but really systemic issues, we must talk about power and get power into the hands of women. And that does begin by valuing women. We will be uh, coming back to you, um, Malaya, to just, uh, you know, go deeper into these issues. But I want to turn to, um, to Crispin, um, who has also, uh, you know, been involved in uh, developing a variety of gender uh, policies and programs um, in, a, in a range of country uh, context specific uh, realities. And so as you have been working on these issues that intersect with tackling violence against women and um, the broader women's economic empowerment agenda, from your perspective, can you tell us about the role of men? Um, and uh, and uh, while you are the only uh, person on the panel that identifies as a man, not just as a tokenistic man, but really you're someone that has um, been integrating this in, in your area of work. So um, Crispin, uh, to you. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, I'm just going to um, ask if you can, uh, and we're not seeing you on the screen either. Let's see. Is it better now? Much better, thank you, and I, I can see you. Okay, no problem. So uh, I am saying that I uh, thank you first of all for the opportunity and so happy to uh, present alongside uh, uh, phenomenal women who have done a lot in this space. So just to answer your question, I would uh, start with a brief uh, story. Back in 2008, in August 1, uh, there was a story in Uganda whereby a nurse was actually murdered by the husband. Uh, that time, of course, according to the husband, the, the, this woman, who was the wife, ought to be home early. But uh, according to her, the hospitals were so overstretched, as we all know the issue of COVID that time. And so uh, she had to spend extra time at the hospital because that is what duty uh, called for. And uh, it got to a point where the husband said, it's either me or the hospital, we can't have you both. And actually um, the conflict ensued. At the end of the day, he murdered her in the house in front of our children, of his children. And so we ask ourselves in Uganda back in the 2019, there was a study by the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, and they established that uh, in Uganda, the doctor-patient ratio was 1 to 25,000 people, and the patient, I mean, nurse-patient ratio was 1 to 11,000 people. So when you look at that and the cost of preparing, of training a nurse, for example, who is a woman in this case, and, uh, and, and now she's out of the scene, Imagine the economic effect even to the, to the government itself, to our family where she's a breadwinner, and even to the psychosocial effects that, of course, would uh, trickle down to the children in the, because of the absence of a mother in this case. So in all that scenario, we ask, I ask myself whenever I am part of the policy development process, uh, what is the benefit of, uh, of, of us, for example, men, really injuring women or, of, or at least... Um, uh, doing all these issues of violence, GBV and violence against women. And you go back to, we are trying to feed what I can call our internalized misogyny and of course the issues of cultural norms that have been so settled and accepted. And so this is making us not to view them as how they ought to be. So in this case, when I look at the question you've just asked, I want to answer this way. There are men, we have a role that it might be threefold, or at least if we look at it uh, from uh, this perspective. That, for instance, we've talked about this lady nurse that has been murdered, who is taking care of 11,000 people, both men, women, and children. And so men, we look for us to respond to the issue of violence against women. Uh, we need to look at ourselves as clients who receive the services of female doctors, female nurses, and all those that are within the public health spectrum. And so when we look at it as clients, <clears throat> then we'll be able to understand that for sure we cannot continue uh, to, to, uh, to advance or to this course or be able to continue to inflict more pain and injury to this women. Number two, I want to look at us as men as a support system 
whereby we cannot continue to be bystanders. And so we must be able to, uh, to look at what is best for us and not just for us as men, but also for the general public. And also number three, I would say that a men, it's for us to, uh, to engage in attending to the issues of violence against women, we must be change agents. In which case, when we are talking about policy that I have been engaged uh, in so many ways, we, one thing that are, is clear in my mind is we cannot necessarily legislate behavior and or culture but the, 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 the kind of legislations that we bring on forth is so that there is meaningful, intentional engagement of these women, I mean of men, positively, men and boys, so that then we are able to provide, uh, in other words, a cure to violence against women, or at least GBV, uh, uh, in, uh, within the private and public spaces, at household levels, at community levels, at workplace levels. And this, of course, at the end of the day, will lead to what we can call positive changes in our attitudes, in our perceptions, and in our behavior that will benefit men, women and girls, and in return benefit all of us. So that's how we look at it, and that is what we are. I'm saying that if we continue to do so, addressing it at all levels and ensuring that men uh, form a credible constellation of actors, then we will be able to address this issue uh, amicably at all those levels. And at the end of the day, we shall be able then to have um, a GBV-free society or violence-free uh, public uh, uh, environment for women who are, of course, in the sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Crispin, for just your insights there. And uh, wanted to come back to you. You know, there's um, as you were sharing this this story, this um, you know, a horrific uh, loss. Uh, unfortunately, it happens too too often. And one of our attendees in the chat talks about how uh, you know the perception that culture also contributes to the violence that women um, are facing. And 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 she cites the example of the continent Africa and going um, more deeply into the country of Est Estuani, where the numbers are really increasing. Um, and you know, kind of turning it to you at the individual level, because you have, have um, been able to, at the individual level, um, really drive programs um, that factor in the cultural context. Um, and um, how um, do you uh, approach this when people say it's, you know, it's, it's tradition, it's how to keep a woman um, in place. Um, and, you know, and there is a lot of tension on this you know another panelist earlier talked about valuing women and um and we at women in global health do a lot of advocacy around making sure that women are um uh, going from uh, unpaid work um to formally uh, jobs and we know that women's economic empowerment often comes very closely with increased violence that they're facing because of the power dynamic so how do you in your um in your programs um and and the experience that you've had individually in leading programs that look at these issues and address this um, you know, cultural aspect. Uh, thank you so much. As a, as a cultural anthropologist myself, uh, in the part of being my background, and when I bring that into uh, gender issues, I always say uh, uh, gender is, of course, uh, very dynamic. And so uh, culture is dynamic as well. And so in Kenya, what we try to do, for instance, if I can give my own example, uh, I have done policies, gender policies for about five counties in Kenya. There's a way we divide it into levels of government, the central government and county system. And in each county, it has been, uh, they are tailored to the situation of that county. For example, if we go to Meru County, one of the counties, and uh, where for, uh, issues of um, uh, sexual gender-based violence is so high in terms of all the different uh, uh, sort of uh, the prevalence. We, we, I am able to engage them at different levels. For example, if it's the cultural custodians, we are able to dissect the subject and be able to really ask ourselves, what are we benefiting from? For example, when we continue uh, undertaking the practice of female genital mutilation, for example. So when we have that discussion <clears throat> and we try to personify the, the discussion, then they see sense because many times when you talk, they are like, uh, you're excluded. You talk about the other women. But here we're not <clears throat> talking about the other women. We are talking about the women who are your wife, your aunties, your, your daughters and stuff like that. So we try to bring the conversation home. 
so that then they own it, then they are able to see that for sure, we cannot be able to continue in this uh, direction. So I would say that I, I approach it at all those different levels. And in Kenya, I'm um, a he for she uh, champion for quite some time now. And so the, 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 the challenge we've also found is that even the people in offices who are supposed to implement these policies, for instance, they have either little understanding or they also have they, they have their cultures with them in their offices. So they don't that put a veil on, 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 on their faces. They're not able to see policy for what it is, interpret it correctly, and enforce it correctly. And so we go back to really getting them to understand what that means in order to translate, quote unquote, to convert them in order uh, uh, for them to be able to, to implement. Otherwise, with what I call the early internalized misogyny, then it will be difficult for even the, the, the men who are in the offices to be able to really uh, disseminate this. And so is to uh, extent, a great extent uh, to our women who have uh, accepted all these things. And so it becomes difficult um, uh, to also sort of uh, uh, cause them to learn and, and, and unlearn so that then they are able to work together with these men and move in a way that will help, I mean, um, that will cause a transformation in attitude, in behavior, in how we relate the issues of relations between men and women, and above all, how we view power and the issue of power imbalances between men and women. And thank you, Crispin, uh, for those insights. And uh, again, we're hearing a lot of themes that have been uh, said across the panel about power, transformation, making this everybody's business. And also, you know, you, you highlighted the point that, you know, women are growing up with the same gender norms and roles um, uh, that are prescribed to other women. So challenging, challenging that and, uh, and, and really working as a uh, broader societal issue. Um, so I would actually like to um, invite um, Avni again to join us. And, um, you know, one question we must uh, really reflect on as we are facing so much conflict around the world. Um, we're already in a state of crisis as we're facing um, an unprecedented global pandemic of our times. Um, but we also are seeing conflict in many environments. Most recently, um, Ukraine is on top of mind, but we know there's conflict happening uh, in Yemen, Ethiopia could go to countless countries country, uh, and uh, regions around the world. Um, so, you know, asking you, Avni, how do we safeguard women health workers against violence when they're serving in conflict or remote zones? And, and also, how do we prepare our health workers for the influx um, of patients who also um, have faced violence as these things uh, uh, happen overnight and they happen in large scale? Um, so yeah, turning it to you, Avni. Thank you, Rupa. And you know, even as we speak, there's reports uh, of uh, maternity hospitals and health uh, facilities in Ukraine being attacked, which is just devastating for on so many on so many counts. Um, you know, the thing that so one of the things that we are doing is recognizing uh, and putting it out there that gender-based violence increases in every kind of health emergency. Uh, we have seen this in Ethiopia, we have seen this in DRC, we have seen this um, in just so, so, so many set, uh, settings. And uh, we do work very concertedly now with the health emergencies program in WHO. Uh, all of our tools that I mentioned, in fact, we have what we call the humanitarian uh, adaptations to them. And we are currently, as we speak, working in 13 countries uh, in humanitarian conflicts, including Syria, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, northern Nigeria, um, e uh, Ethiopia as well. And one of the things is that I always say that um, part, of, part of what we do is to create an awareness uh, through our trainings uh, to what we call denormalize, to, to actually get people to recognize that any form of violence, be it you know, uh, violence that women face in their homes or violence in the health workplace is just not acceptable uh, and that it has health consequences. And I think putting it out there from the health lens is often a very um, neutral way of 
of gaining credibility because it's it's very difficult to go into a country like Syria or Afghanistan and say, hey, you're perpetrating violence and this is a human rights violation. But it is easier to talk a little bit about the health consequences. It provides a, a more neutral ground to get people to think about, okay, what do we do about it? How do we stop it? How do we prevent it? How do we speak out against it? Um, and, and how do we respond? I mean, the the, the it, it, one of the tactics we have started using in our trainings is to counter violence with a narrative of compassion and empathy, because that's an emotion that I think people can recognize. People mm -hmm. can relate to it's it moves away from this finger you know finger pointing blaming um a negative narrative and talk about how do we build respectful cultures how do we build uh, empathetic cultures how do we build compassion within the way and the other thing we also point out is that the way we approach this uh, solution to violence is also going to benefit people, not just in terms of ending violence, but in all aspects of healthcare provision, um, you know, in terms of providing what we call gender responsive care. Uh, it's going to benefit the way they provide maternity care, the way they talk to children, the way they talk to NCD patients. So it's, it's, it's something just in terms of countering that narrative and culture and I don't know that I have an answer to attacks on hospitals and facilities during wartime. I mean, this is just something that there is an international humanitarian law that, that clearly forbids this. Uh, but you have states that violate these, the international humanitarian law with impunity, as we well know. So that part, I don't know. But I think if we continuously build the cultures of nonviolence and compassion, and I do say, and this is why, why I think building that concepts uh, from medical school, nursing school, um, and even in undergraduate levels is, is so crucial. Um, well, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Avni. I think, you know, it's a, we, we need a panel on just, uh, just this issue because there's so much um, uh, to surface here. And as you said, norm, norm shifting is a critical and it needs to begin within the health sector, with the, with, it, with the future generation, but also in the, in the broader of how we um, are looking at um, global governance and what's normal or not at, at member state level. And so, you know, I do appreciate you pointing out, um, you know, how these rules are not being followed and um, hospitals and health workers are being targeted. Um, and it is really, really unfortunate, but it is also part of the broader um, issue of violence and violence um, of how we uh, target health workers in, in conflict. Um, so, you know, we are at the last bit of our panel. Uh, we have a few more minutes to go. I do want to give each of our panelists a chance to do one final uh, round of rapid fire is what I call it, a key takeaway message that you want um, all of us that are tuning in uh, and listening to this now or at a future time. What's your call to action? How do we take this conversation um, that we've been uh, already building on from previous works uh, of decades, how do we take it forward um, in, in this year of action is what we call it at Women, Women in Global Health. So I'm gonna first um, invite uh, uh, Claudia please give us your one takeaway uh, and action ask. Uh, thank you, Rupa, and thank you all the speakers. I'm really thrilled with all the perspectives that were shared uh, here. And one of the reflections that I wanted to, to share before uh, giving my message is that um, all, of, all of the things that were shared here, it just proves that um, it, it's not only one action, one individual that takes action, but it needs multi-dimensional approach. And we, we spoke about power dynamics. We spoke about gender criticism, um, norm uh, criticism. We, we spoke about uh, structural changes and so on. And I, I believe that um, all of us are happy here to contribute to one of those, um, those dimensions. And it was just continue to, um, to keep to keep improving and we will just march towards more um, more gender equal healthcare systems and also gender responsive healthcare systems. Uh, so yeah, my my main call to action is just to um, for for medical schools, for universities, for all the academics that teach healthcare professionals to create a socially accountable medical schools curricula so that when we enter 
um, the world of, of uh, service. We, are, we know how to attend survivors and we know how to communicate with them. That's the most important thing that, that I, can, I can take for myself because um, skills, knowledge, yeah. we can learn ourselves, but communication is something that we should practice and um, a lot in, in medical school. So that would be my main uh, call to action. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Claudia. You highlighted a lot there. And I think the call to action is to all of us here. Let's use partnerships to support uh, all health professional trainees. Here's a call to action for the medical students, but I'm sure all the others also want to be part of this. Uh, I'll turn it next to Kalkadon. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the reflections uh, is that from this webinar is the fact that violence against women is like any every setting is not immune from violence against women, whether it's high income, low income country, the extent might vary, but there is violence against women in every setting and we should actually acknowledge that in works to eliminate it from everywhere. The, uh, the key as for the key thing that I want to highlight is like one of the topics that I've mentioned regarding is women's leadership in addressing a prevention of sexual, sexual abuse, exploitation and harassment and generally violence against women is a very much priority and critical and we should incorporate it in our policies, whatever we do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kakadan. Uh, uh, Malaya, to you. Uh, well, uh, my closing thought really, or my call to action is to really reflect on what we mean very concretely when we talk about valuing women and transferring uh, power to women. And certainly listening is one of the most important things. You know, if women are 70% of the frontline health workers, I think what we saw in the COVID response is as soon as there was power and money to have in a pandemic response, those who kind of made decisions and were on the front line were emergency workers who were often men. So what does it really mean to uh, value women and the work that women are uh, doing, both the formal and informal work? And I'll just end with a Valentine's Day card, although it's a, you know, a little bit late here. I saw a card, a heteronormative one. So a man was asking his female partner, you know, chocolates or flowers? And she answered, rights. Right. And and so by valuing, I don't mean a little ceremony and thank you for your hard work. I mean, really, truly valuing and centering the work that women do. And, and I'll take rights, chocolate and flowers. Personally, I'll just. The whole <laughs> Uh, and, you know, we, we, we often talk about, you know, we need to turn the applause of health workers, the candle lighting into real action investments and in supporting them. So very much uh, we need new new Valentine Day cards um, to, to you, uh, Crispin. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupa. I think my what I can say is that um, when I saw Dr. Avin's uh, presentation, sorry, my camera uh, when I saw Dr. Avin's presentation, I think there's a lot happening, for example, at the World, uh, World Health Organization level that also needs to be cascaded down at the very local level. But most importantly, you realize that the more we legislate, the more issues of violence against women are on the rise. So I, I think that um, we, we, we need to look at what is, what's happening and where is this within the pipeline that there is a big leakage that with the more legislation, more crime, more violence. And uh, so on my part, I would say that uh, it, it, it's time, for example, like as in Kenya and East Africa, uh, to do similar studies like the ones that were shown earlier in order to really uh, establish uh, evidence and in-depth research, of course. And I remember during one of um, our webinars sometimes back, people say that uh, let women's grievances and of course what they express be carried out as evidence so that then we know that uh, uh, what's happening within the hospitals, for example, within the public health systems in order for us to respond better because so long as our doctors, uh, female nurses are uh, under the threat of violence against them, they will not offer the best service. So we need an environment that is safe, secure for them in order for us or them to be able to respond um, uh, to the issues of uh, GBV and violence against women that happen to the people outside of the hospitals. So I think that uh, it will take that more sectoral approach, as one has said, but most importantly, uh, getting down to, get to the basics to establish 
clear evidence that is contextualized and we run with it. Thank you. And thank you for that. And Avni, one, one last uh, call to action on your end. <laughs> Mine is a very practical one, uh, perhaps not as inspiring, but I'd love for uh, IFIMSA to identify champions within your medical schools and your institutions. And we would love to work with you to create cultures, medical cultures that are safe and compassionate and responsive to violence for everyone, not just for patients, but for yourselves as well. Really, really appreciate that. A very pragmatic one. Uh, so again, thank you to our partners. Thank you to our panelists. I'm going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Magda Ravello to close us out. And I um, appreciate everyone hanging on for a few more minutes. We will be wrapping up. Magda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ropa. Um, I'm sure we all agree that this has been a masterclass webinar. Uh, we taught full presentations and experience sharing from our expert panelists and uh, superb moderation by uh, Dr. Rupa Dads. Thank you very much. Um, I want also to thank uh, our participants who were actively sharing uh, their views, experiences, and asking questions uh, in the chat and Q&A. It has been informative, solutions-oriented, and inspirational to hear the experiences they have shared uh, and the work being done to address violence against women. Uh, the panel highlights the fact that we have a long way to go, but we are not short of determination to walk that long way and we'll get there, definitely. I want to end uh, by summarizing six critical points from the discussion uh, that we have just ended. Uh, firstly, Violence and harassment are widespread in the health sector. I think the presentation uh, and the, the discussion that ensued uh, demonstrate that even though data is still very scanty and um, uh, fragmented, we have uh, noticed and we have documented, despite the underreporting of violence against women, that uh, violence against women has serious consequences for the physical and mental health and well-being of all health and care workers, particularly women, and impose heavy costs on health systems, on communities, and on societies. Violence against women is a public health and not a personal or a women issue. The second um, point I wanted to, to make as a way of uh, concluding this webinar is that some groups of women health workers are more vulnerable to abuse. Those who are migrant workers, women marginalized by race, by ethnicity, disability, the youth, caste, class, etc. Women in remote locations and in conflict zones, there was mention of Ethiopia, of um, uh, Syria, uh, Ukraine, etc. We have to take an intersectional approach to uh, policy solutions that are required for addressing uh, this public health issue. My third point is about uh, the fact that violence against women varies in prevalence and form between and within countries, proving that it is not an inevitable part of the job in health and can be prevented. Number four, violence and harassment are heavily underreported and data is fragmented. Underreporting means that this abuse is largely invisible and there is no redress or public shame for perpetrators to act as a deterrent. The fifth point I would like to make is that addressing wider gender inequity in the health workforce, including women's underrepresentation in leadership and occupational segregation of women with lower status, roles, and specialties, with all will all contribute to reducing violence and harassment. Last but not least, violence and harassment against women in the health sector is part of a bigger pattern of violence against women and girls. 
And in the vast majority of cases, it's perpetrated by male colleagues, male patients, and male members of the community. It is therefore a man's problem, not a woman's problem. We can't make it the responsibility of women to change men's behavior. And we hope we will see more ease for she's, as is the case uh, of our uh, uh, panelists from, from Kenya. In Women in Global Health, we will continue to campaign for an end to violence and harassment against women and all workers in the health sector. Please join us on this journey. Whatever we do and wherever we are, each of us is responsible for creating safe space for women. And we must never see violence and harassment as a normal part of a job. It is not. We must hold each other accountable and demand more from our senior leadership, from governments and from global leaders. Women have made an extraordinary contribution to health systems and societies. In two years of the pandemic, they now need a new social contract with safe, decent and equal work. I would like to express our sincere appreciation from Women in Global Health to our speakers, to our partners who organized this uh, webinar. And thank you all for attending this event. Have a happy International Women's Day and happy March. Thank you very much. <laughs>